why Mauritania? Um, I've been working on mining projects, like Jerry's mining <laughs> projects, um, there as, as an archaeological uh, advisor and surveyor for the last five years. Um, and again, same issues of place and dots on a map, but not necessarily the, the bigger picture of long-term impacts on, on the culture and, and continuity of a country. So where is it? Um, Mauritania is a, it's a crossroads between cultures. It links North Africa with Sub-Saharan Africa. And just for comparative purposes, it's five times the size of the UK and about twice the size of France. Um, as you can see from the statistics, um, it has a number of, of um, social issues, um, but it has got a you know, small population, enormously large area, and I'll start off with a, with a quick run-in of the history and archaeology. There's a deep history dating back to the early prehistoric period. Um, the area has undergone extensive changes in climate, um, and the desert has intermittent periods of being lush and green. Um, it's now hyper-arid, but once it was, it was a beautiful place to, to live, and life was relatively easy. Um, it has a very rich but poorly documented um, archaeological heritage. Um, that have in, investigations have been have been fairly limited or quite specific, um, and there's a there's a good general overview of, of of what's going on, but they're still working on producing a, a national national database. Um, in the 10th to 11th century, the Almohad dynasty created an empire which stretched from Mauritania right up to Spain. Um, and the dynasty originated among the nomadic Berber tribes of the Sahara. The trans-Saharan caravan trade um, flourished uh, between about 500 AD and 1590, um, transporting slaves, salt, gold, foodstuffs, cloths, perfumes and gum Arabic between Ghana and Mali and across the Maghreb. From the 19th, late 19th century with a slow encroachment of French colonists from the south and it achieved independence in 1960. It is a, it's got a mosaic of ethnic and tribal and caste identities with distinct languages and cultures and lifestyles. There's a, there's a long, long list on the, on the um, PowerPoint there of the, of the various people that, and, and groups and identities that make up the nation. Um, the ethnic and social boundaries are not completely rigid. Economic and demographic and political factors in recent times have, have created new divisions and, and new alliances. Um, there have been ethnic confrontations over the use of the national language um, and languages in education. Um, because living national languages are, are linked to ethnicity and education and ultimately to power. Historically, there have been ethnic clashes um, between pro-Arabization groups and black Africans. Um, and there was a period of ethnic cleansing um, in 1990 to 1991. Um, Sharia law has been implemented since 1980 and there are currently tensions between Islamist groups and moderate groups. The country has a series of, of human rights issues and also suffers from corruption, crushing poverty and the, these entrenched uh, social and ethnic tensions. Um, this diagram indicates the traditional social structures of the um, Baydan or, or Arab Berber Moor group. Um, elements of these traditional systems persist today with some very positive aspects such as duties of mutual support, hospitality, obligation and protection between the castes which are transmitted through the generations. However, the country has got human rights issues as I mentioned before such as 
child labour, female genital mutilation and slavery. Uh, in terms of slavery in 2015, the uh, Walk Free organisation ranked Mauritania at the top of the Global Slavery Index, saying that slaves constitute a higher proportion of the population than anywhere else in the world, and that's about 4% of the population, which means approximately 150,000 people are enslaved against their will. I'll now run through a, a quick overview of, of the environment of the country, which will give some indications leading up to the, the intangible heritage. Most of the country is an arid desert with areas of Sahel in the south and the fringes of the Sahara, a narrow band of agricultural land by the Senegal River along the southern frontier. Martinez southern frontier is formed by the Senegal River. The area is characterised by irrigated agriculture and relatively rich cattle grazing grounds. The Atlantic coast has extensive fishing grounds. The desert runs right up to the sea and people live in small, isolated rural fishing villages. Um, there is rivalry from fishermen from uh, other West African countries and very significant competition from international industrial fishing. In the centre is highly specialised agriculture, uh, dependent on oases and wells and government supplied water bladders. Um, on the right hand picture there is the label on a water bottle depicting a kind of obsessive national ideal of camels and deer grazing together in a verdant oasis. However, it's, it's a dream that doesn't really reflect the reality of daily life in, in this marginal environment. In the north and east of the country is an even harsher area, again dependent on um, wells and water bladders and water trucks. Um, the nomadic pastoralists in the area um, frequently tend large herds of other people's camels belonging to wealthy urban families. Some of them make additional income by selling camel milk. There's a uh, roadside camel milk stand there. And the camels uh, transform salty and undrinkable well water into sweet milk, which is really key to survival here. The culture of the country is in transition due to wider demographic factors. The West African droughts of the 70s and 80s decimated livestock, causing an exodus to the cities. Many families had to give up their nomadic livelihoods, um, moving to the few cities of considerable size, um, and subsequently locust invasions, further droughts, and environmental degradation have continued to intensify this disurbanization. So the capital city, picture on the right there, uh, founded and a population of about 5,000 independents and now it's almost a million. So these ongoing factors are impacting many aspects of culture and I'll now outline two of them, um, desert medicine and calligraphy. Sorry, there's the population. Um, sedentarization and move to the capital cities. So in Africa overall, the World Health Organization estimates that up to 80% of the population uses traditional medicine for primary health care. Um, few people have access to medical care and um, traditional medicine attempts to fill this gap. Uh, in Mauritania, there's, there are specialist traditional practitioners who are very, very much respected. And there's also um, medicine practiced by women within families to treat common ailments. Um, medicines include the use of myrrh resin to heal infections, acacia gum, um, rubbing ostrich camel or goat fat for, for lung infections. And on behind me here is an image of, of one of my colleagues um, using a twig from an atil bush as a toothbrush. Sorry, bear with me, it's, it's thinking about it there. Um, knowledge transmission is, is in danger of failing due to sedentarization, displacement, modernization. Some of the plant species are being lost by, due to desert, desertification. And if you're stuck in a, in a very, very large and growing capital city, you can't go out and gather the plants and, and other, other things that you need. Um, 
the WHO has, has launched a, a traditional medicine strategy back in 2002 to help countries to test the efficiency, efficacy and, and safety and um, to regulate traditional medicine. And there are strong efforts to preserve and transmit uh, this knowledge in Mauritania. There's been research since, well, going a long way back, but recent studies in the 90s, a decade of traditional medicine was announced by the government. There have been exhibitions and there's also sponsored conferences of the Mauritanian Traditional Medicine Association. Moving on to um, calligraphy. Um, Quranic schools and universities once thrived in oasis towns um, and Mauritania is known throughout the Arab world, if, if not in the West, um, for its enormously rich heritage of Arabic manuscripts, um, including Quran, the astronomy, maths, geometry, law, poetry, grammar, it, it, it's, all, it's all there. Um, some of them dating back to the 11th century. Um, but most of the country's 33,000 recorded manuscripts are kept in private family collections and under conservation, major conservation issues, um, also sand and termites aren't good for them. Calligraphy is still practiced, very much respected. Um, the manuscripts are being protected by a series of programs which date back to um, the 1970s, in fact, when, when the um, universities of Freiburg and Tübingen uh, did a microfilm project, and now that's been digitized, and, and uh, two and a half thousand are now online. Um, there's cataloging projects, conservation labs are being set up, um, and a number of international conservation agencies are working together with, with the um, authorities and other funders to, to help the manuscripts. Um, calligraphy itself is still practiced. Um, this and the manuscripts are the pride and joy of the nation. They really do love them. However, only about 40% of the population can read. So this is, this is a, an issue. In terms of formal cultural heritage protection regimes, um, the Mauritania has one group world heritage site, um, which is the, the ancient um, cities, which were trading religious centres um, founded in the 11th and 12th centuries to serve caravans crossing the Sahara. Mauritania signed the Intangible Heritage Convention in 2006, and I'll now turn to three examples of, of UNESCO-sponsored ICH. Um, the, 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 the Moorish epic Thaydin, performed by griots, accompanied by traditional instruments and uh, fishing along the Atlantic coast. Um, the epic encompasses dozens of poems in the Hassania language, um, praising the glorious feats of the Moorish emirs and sultans. Um, it is in decline under threat. Performers are few and far between and fairly elderly sometimes. Demand for performance has decreased and young griots tend to perform the epic in a short form, if at all. Um, most of them live in the capital city and they perform a standard repertoire of, of praise songs to whoever will pay them for them. They've kind of risked becoming wedding singers, um, abandoning their, their roots and singing a modern popular repertoire. It has been included on the National Inventory of Cultural Heritage um, there's a number of public ed education programs and, and you, can, you can search YouTube and find, find this online. Um, however, its inscription is slightly controversial because this has been very much promoted, but little has been done to protect or promote or gain international recognition for the music of other parts of the population. The people of the fishing village of Ramgar use dolphins to drive shoals of migrating fish towards uh, the shore in their nets. There's a sym symbiotic man and, man and dolphin moment going on. And some others beat the water with sticks to, to herd fish. Um, it's a cultural practice very much associated with the sustainable use of the Bondarguin National Park 
um, a natural world heritage site that it lies within. It's very specific to that area and to a small community. Moving on to, to a wider, earlier ICH programme, um, this isn't formally inscribed on any list, but it was part of um, a wider programme going back 10, 15 years. In contrast to the first two examples, this old project is inclusive and recognises the key role of women in the intergenerational transmission and renewal of ICH. It aimed to raise awareness of the significance of women's roles and to inform culturally sensitive development activities. It accepted stories involving folk Islam and syncretic mixtures of, of Sufi Islam and an African traditional religion. And unlike the more recent ICH initiatives I described in the previous two slides, um, this covers all languages, all parts of the country, and recognises the role of half the population in ICH. So, concluding and, and, and reviewing, um, the droughts in the 70s and 80s resulted in an enormous and ongoing cultural upheaval. Um, with nomadic pastoralists moving to the cities, desertification increasing, and very fast social change. Cultural tourism initiatives um, in the 90s uh, did aim to support traditional life ways and crafts and cultural industries. However, these are now foundering due to rising militant insurgency in the Maghreb. There is increasing industrialization. There's regional environmental pressure and, and insecurity giving rise to greater contact with other cultures, internal migrants and international workers, as in the case with, with Jerry's project. Um, the impacts of colonisa colonisation going back, modern education, technology, mobile phones, mass communication, they're also altering what is seen as being traditional. And I've got two images here that, that exemplify to me that the changes that are happening. The first is a traditional nomad's tent with a solar panel next to it, so it'll be able to power up probably the mobile. And on the right um, is a building site which is banning the wearing of traditional boo-boo gowns. Now boo-boo gowns are equivalent to a western suit and they're, they're worn with, with great dignity. And these are banned from building sites because they're dangerous and get trapped in machinery. But in taking that away, you take away the, the aplomb of, of, and dignity of, of, of some of the workers. So to conclude, intangible heritage in, in Mauritania really is in, in flux and evolving to adapt to cultural dislocation and transformation. Thank you.